Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, entanglement in the quantum field theory, in, in quantum field theory and quantum gravity, and I'll just discuss only a few aspects. Um, so we all know what entanglement is in the context of ordinary quantum mechanics. We have two separated uh, uh, experimenters, Alice and Bob, and each one has a quantum system. And in quantum mechanics, we can have correlations between the observations that these two uh, observers make, which are stronger than classical correlations. They are stronger in the sense that they violate uh, Bell's inequalities. For that, we need, for that it's important that we have here, each, of, each observer can measure the value of two, two non-commuting operators. And you can have states where they are always correlated with the results that Bob measures. Okay, so that's in quantum mechanics. In uh, quantum field theory, just the ordinary vacuum is a state of this kind. So if we have an observer uh, on this side, in this region, and an observer in the other region, uh, and they do measurements on the vacuum, they can, so the type of measurement they can do is measure uh, correlation functions of uh, fields. We know that uh, the two-point correlation function of fields is uh, non-trivial. Um, and it can be shown that uh, they are non-trivial in the same way that uh, they are non-trivial for entanglement. And indeed, you can even uh, violate Bell's inequalities by doing uh, measurements of um, measurements that, in measurements done by observers uh, who never have causal contact with each other. Um, and it's uh, easy to quantify the amount of entanglement that we have in the ordinary vacuum. And one way to understand that is to choose simply uh, an observer who always remains in this uh, wedge of the uh, Minkowski diagram. It's called the uh, Rinder space. And we choose these coordinates. And then the density matrix, uh, when we trace out the left side, is equal to the thermal density matrix in Rinder space. And um, this Rinder observer sees a temperature which is equal to the acceleration. So an observer sitting at a fixed star measures the temperature, which is of this form. Um, and computing the thermal entropy of this um, of the system here, we'll get the amount of entanglement that we have. And this amount of entanglement is roughly the number of bell pairs, so uh, spin systems, that were qubits that we have. Um, and in this case, we have this thermal entropy in the sitter, in, in Rindler space, and it's equal to the area divided by uh, the UV cutoff. So it's a divergent quantity. Um, and it's divergent because the temperature becomes very high as you approach uh, this, uh, this region. And so you have an infinite amount of entanglement in the original uh, Minkowski vacuum. Um, of course, in order to access this entanglement, you have to do a weird thing. You have to be a very accelerating observer who uh, does this measurement. And this guy also has to accelerate very, uh, very fast. And, but they can access an infinite amount of entanglement in principle. Um, OK. So that's in uh, field theory. That's in ordinary field theory. In, once you include gravity, something interesting happens, which is that this uh, divergence gets cut off. And the easiest way to understand how it's cut, it, it is cut off and removed by something finite is to do the computation in Euclidean signature. So in Euclidean signature, we can uh, compute the, um, the thermodynamics of uh, Rindler space by continuing to um, to Euclidean space and making the temperature that we saw in the previous transparency. So being uh, periodic, we, we take the circle being in Euclidean space being periodic with the temperature we saw in last transparency. Uh, we get a disk, a smooth disk. But in order to calculate the entropy, we need to take the derivative with respect to the temperature. So we need to change the size of this disk slightly. And that introduces a conical singularity. And uh, this conical singularity is the origin of uh, that diversions that we saw before. But when we have gravity, we, um, we can change this temperature. And what can happen is that the space-time adjusts itself into a smooth geometry. And in this smooth geometry, there is no singularity anywhere for any temperature. And then we obtain manifestly a finite answer for all temperatures. We take the derivative with respect to the temperature, and we get a finite answer. Um, and this uh, was uh, and this was done, um, of course, in the case of black holes by Gibbons and Hawking. And they obtained the finite answer, which is the usual uh, entropy formula. 
plus the quantum corrections, which correspond to doing the quantum fields on this, on this, uh, on this geometry, which gives you something manifestly finite. Um, so if we want go back to the Lorentzian case, what is going on is that as you raise the temperature, the uh, black hole is changed, the horizon moves out in such a way that uh, the, temper the, the acceleration of a local observer at some fixed position is always equal to the temperature as you approach uh, the new horizon. Um, so and this is understood to hold quite generically. So originally it was understood for black holes, but it also holds for uh, more generic configurations such as, for example, in ADS-CFT, if you consider the entanglement entropy in, um, in the field theory, in the boundary field theory, gets, gets mapped to a problem of entanglement in the bulk, um, which is rather similar to this, except we don't have perfect U1 symmetry, um, and so on. And there is a lot of uh, work done in this area that I don't have time to review right now. Um, um, so we, we know that uh, black holes are uh, thermal systems as uh, seen from the thermal systems and ordinary quantum systems as seen from the outside, or at least we believe this is true. And for example, um, if you have a, a person, Bob, who stays outside the black hole, uh, we think that uh, the black hole uh, can be replaced perhaps by some ordinary quantum system or behaves for all practical purposes like an ordinary quantum system with a finite number of degrees of freedom given by the black hole entropy. Um, now, um, if you can have situations where a black hole um, emits radiation and after a long time, the black hole uh, becomes entangled with radiation. And so you have a situation where now, again, you have two quantum systems of a black hole entangled now with radiation. So it's kind of interesting to try to understand the situations where the black hole is entangled with a second system and try to understand what happens in these cases. Now, uh, this is an interesting case, but we'll first uh, study a simplified case. As usually in physics, we try to understand the simple cases first and then move on to more complicated cases. Um, and so we imagine uh, we have two uh, experimentalists, Alice and Bob, each one has uh, their own black holes. So instead of having a spin system, we have a black hole, which we said is like a very complicated system with many degrees of freedom, but qualitatively no different than having a single spin. Um, and now we, have a, we seem to have a small puzzle because we could think that the entanglement entropy of the black hole comes from the entanglement between the outside of the black hole with the interior of the black hole. That is similar to this entanglement we had in Minkowski space where we had only access to some region of Minkowski space. Here we only have access to the exterior, uh, but we don't have access to the interior. And the question is, uh, so but now we have that uh, this black hole seems to be entangled with its interior and this one with the other interior. That's a little puzzle. But let's, uh, let's not worry about that for the moment. Um, let's say that we consider the following particular entangled state. And this is a particularly simple entangled state. And I'm talking about this state because we'll give a geometric interpretation for what this state uh, will be. So it's a state that uh, is often considered in thermal field theories. Uh, it's called the thermal field double state. So you take all, all the eigenstates, all the states of the black hole, and you entangle them in this particular way. And the idea is that uh, this, this particular entangled state of the two black holes is given by a geometry where the interior is essentially uh, shared between the two black holes. So uh, a region very close to the horizon in one black hole is also very close to the horizon of the other black hole. So the black holes are connected through the horizon. This is the simplest solution of Einstein's equations with spherical symmetries, the solution that Schwarzschild found many years ago. And it's still teaching us lessons. And I think it, this is a particular, very important lesson that it's teaching us. Not everyone agrees that uh, this is the right interpretation to the, of this geometry. I uh, should put this qual qualifier. But I think it is the right interpretation. And I think we should take it very seriously to understand the problems of black holes. So, this geometry has uh, this connection. Uh, this spatial section looks like an asymptotically flat space and another asymptotically flat space joined through this neck. Uh, sometimes it's called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Um, and so this, these are two regions very far away. And we could think of the, the region near this black hole as uh, the 
exterior of Alice's black hole and this other region as the exterior of both black hole. The two black holes could be far, very far away from each other. So one could be here, the other one in the Andromeda galaxy. But if we are one meter away from one black hole and the other person is one meter away from the other black hole, they would be two meters away through the interior of the black hole. Okay. Um, now, the geometry, the geometry is such that uh, it is not possible, if Alice remains outside, Alice cannot send the signal to Bob, because if Alice sends a signal, then it uh, will hit the singularity, but it will never come back out. So, as I said, this distance, which is two meters, is a spatial distance, okay? And in order to send the signal, what happens is, what happens is that the two, these two horizons start moving away from each other in the interior, and it's hard to make a signal, to send a signal. However, um, if they go into the interior, then in principle, they can meet. So we can arrange for this meeting. So we are, one person is here, the other one in Andromeda Galaxy. We go in, and we meet in the interior of the black hole. Uh, so this, they can arrange for a brief but fatal meeting, uh, and they get punished by dying at the singularity. Um, now the question is, so this was the case for a very simple entangled state. What is the situation with more generic entangled states? Well, we can add particles, uh, and then and that's small deformations of the original state that can be understood. Um, there was a case uh, discussed by, recently by Schenker and Stanford of uh, adding shock waves, and what the interesting thing that happens is that the, as you start moving away from this very specific uh, state, what happens is that the distance between these two horizons starts, uh, starts growing. So that state is very special because the distance between the two horizons is minimal. That's what makes it very special. But we don't know what the generic uh, situation is. Uh, so we expect that the generic situation is such that the distance is either very large or that there is some non-geometric feature in the interior. Um, and when we have a black, black hole entangled with radiation, uh, it is uh, natural to extrapolate this picture and say that, well, we have very tiny little bridges that join. So a black, a radiation is like a qubit. You can think of this as a very tiny little black hole. It will have its uh, Einstein-Rosen bridge joining it to the big one. And we don't understand this geometry. It's not more than this picture. Um, and so that's the, the task for the next, next uh, few years, to try to understand where these pictures are correct. And in particular, to understand whether uh, all these guys that join in, do they join in just behind this horizon, just behind the black hole horizon, or do they join in somewhere inside so that you have uh, some comfort of, so that the person that who falls in can fall without uh, suffering anything, anything strange. Um, so we would like to, uh, what we would like ideally is to be able to uh, send a signal behind the horizon if we do something. So, so an important point here is that uh, what an observer that falls into the black hole, uh, what he sees depends on what you do with the system the black hole is entangled with. So you can send signals from a faraway system to the region behind the horizon. And we certainly want to be able to send these signals by doing something very special, but we should not be able to send signals uh, if we do something simple. Uh, so uh, that's our wish list, if we believe that the interior of black holes are smooth. Now, if you believe that there are fireballs behind the horizon, then, well, maybe you can even send signals doing something simple. Um, there's been recently an interesting work by Papadimas and Raju, which uh, give you a certain uh, state-dependent uh, construction of, black of the black hole interior, and uh, it's a very nice construction, but also in some sense is uh, strange because they declare this to be the correct construction. It's not clear what the principles are that determine uh, this construction. Um, and so the question is whether it's enough or whether we just made a definition that works, but maybe it's uh, not what is going on. Um, so in conclusions, um, uh, one of the take home messages is that the ordinary vacuum, which looks like there's nothing going on, is a very highly entangled state. Um, in black holes, this entanglement becomes more easily accessible because uh, through the process of Hawking radiation and so on, we are emitting particles from this region that is um, particles which are initially highly blue shifted, they get red shifted and emitted away, and this entanglement becomes more physically accessible. And it seems to be that very large amounts of entanglement, in, certainly in this context of black holes, can give rise to a geometric connection between two distant systems. And so there seems to be a, 
a close connection between uh, quantum mechanics of entanglement and the appearance, uh, appearance of horizons in, in gravity. And this is, I think, a very interesting connection that uh, we'll probably learn a lot about uh, in the next few years. Um, so it seems that the uh, structure of space-time, uh, the solid structure of space-time, which we solidly rely on, comes from ghostly, might come in some cases, certainly, from the ghostly features of entanglement or uh, the incompleteness of quantum mechanics that EPR were so worried about uh, can be responsible for the continuity of space that uh, ER likes so much. Um, thank you. <laughs>
So by acting with the, you have, we would have to accept that by acting with the radiation, I can make the firewall disappear. So you are already accepting that, um, that by acting on the radiation, I can modify what lies in the interior of a black hole. So now that one has accepted this, it is also natural to accept that perhaps the interior is always smooth, and if you do something very weird with the radiation, you might be able to send a signal in the interior as a way to solve the original uh, AMPS paradox. We're not, we're not giving explicit construction of how to construct the interior in such a way that it's always smooth. So uh, the Papadoima San Raju, for example, is a construction that one could use. It's a state-dependent construction. And that is one possibility. I'm not sure. Maybe there are other possibilities which are also consistent with what we are saying. Um, Any more questions? If not, I have one. Um, yeah. So when, when you are drawing this picture of yeah. a black hole connected with yeah. some mm -hmm. gas of particles flying yeah. around, mm -hmm. and then these wormholes uh, yeah. flowing there, usually we would as associate black holes or wormholes uh, related with objects which are heavier than Planck mass. Right. And the particles which are produced like radiation mm -hmm. are much, much lighter than Planck mass. Yes, yes. So in which sense are you talking about this structure? Uh, is it like virtual wormholes? Okay, like so virtual black holes? What? Right. So the wormholes that connect two spin and a half particles are very quantum, and I don't, uh, we don't have any description for them uh, at all. But the idea is that um, as you have systems of more and more uh, spins, in some situations you can have an actual wormhole that uh, has macroscopic size. For example, so you could have a system of spins that uh, gives you uh, discretization of, let's say, n equal to 4 super young males. And in this case, uh, this system of spins can give rise to an immersion geometry which could be connected by a wormhole if they were entangled in the right way. So a smooth classical wormhole is a property when you have massive amounts of entanglements and certainly for special states. So if uh, you have a system which is a bunch of spins in some random state, so you'll have these tiny wormholes, and the question is how do they connect to the big uh, horizon near the black hole? Do they connect right behind the horizon or do they connect a bit earlier? So that's... Do I understand you correctly yeah. that the whole picture makes sense if you have lots of them? Or even one small particle no, no, well, the, the, already made Okay, so we, we are talking about quantum gravity, and um, the, the black hole is a big state, big quantum system, and uh, it's, uh, suddenly the geometry around the black hole makes sense when we have large mass and large entropy, okay? And that's supposed to connect to another system which has a bunch of spins, right? Um, we don't understand in detail how it connects. Now, near each spin, of course, we don't expect a, a macroscopic block. Wormhole. It's a situation where lots of microscopic thing, things have to give rise and connect into a macroscopic uh, system. So I'm not sure if I'm. Uh, well, I'm not saying exactly how it happens. So the, probably the, Lenny is going to. Lenny, Lenny probably no, tell you exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, let me follow up on Andrew's mm -hmm. question the following way. Mm -hmm. You could imagine that a black hole Hawking radiating could radiate a small black hole instead of a uh, yeah. instead of a yeah. uh, mm -hmm. a small black hole, much smaller than itself, but still big mm -hmm. enough to be called a black hole. Right. Mm -hmm. Is this something we know how to calculate? I don't mean the rate for it. I think we know how to calculate the rate for it. But do we know how to calculate the geometry for it? And do we know how to calculate if uh, if it carries a uh, well, yeah. So the, there is, yeah, there, there is a there is a picture. I mean, Hawking radiation is, is a kind of pair production in the near horizon geometry, right. and something similar to this is the pair production of black holes in a in a magnetic or electric field. And in that case, uh, the black holes are produced with exactly in, in this uh, geometry with a bridge that connects them. Right. What I was wondering and is if so, we know how to go a little bit past that and study a the um, the emission of a small black hole from a Schwarzschild black hole. And see that it carries a wormhole. With it. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do that calculation, but uh, it might be possible to do. Yeah. Okay, if no more questions, then thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>